Good afternoon. I'm Glenn Johnson, Whiskey Zero Golf Juliet, and today we're going to uh, be talking about the Pitcairn Island D Expedition uh, in uh, 2019, um, the VP6R D Expedition, the first ever all flex radio D Expedition. And um, I'll entitle this the Mutiny on the Bands instead of Mutiny on the Bounty. Well, in January of 2018, remember the uh, failed attempt at uh, landing on Bouvet because of the weather and then a weather damaged uh, ship and problems on the ship called the Batanzos. Um, we were so close. We were just offshore uh, Bouvet for uh, four or five days and the weather closed in and really uh, tore up the ship and we limped to uh, South Africa, um, abandoning our attempts to uh, do the first ever uh, real uh, flex radio expedition to Bouvet, uh, to, uh, yeah, Bouvet. Um, and so uh, we decided to uh, try something uh, new. Our team leader said, let's go somewhere fun because we had such a great difficulty uh, on uh, our attempt to getting on Bouvet. So how about going somewhere warm it's where there's some civilization and relatively easy transportation and take some rookies with us too and Pitcairn Island fit that bill. And uh, th it all started uh, back in the 1700s when England needed a cheap source of food to feed their slaves uh, in the Caribbean islands. And this is a breadfruit that Hal is uh, fondling here. And uh, they thought this would be a good cheap source of food. So the British government commissioned the bounty uh, to go to Tahiti to get some breadfruit plants and transplant them in the Caribbean. Well, the ship left in 1777 and attempted to go around the Cape of Good Horn, uh, the tip of South America, and for 30 days they tried to get around the Cape, but the winds just drove them back and tore up their ship, and they limped to uh, South Africa, the Cape of Good Hope, and they repaired their ship and restocked the ship and then went through the Indian Ocean over to Tahiti. They were there for uh, most of a year, and then they started to come back to England, and that's when the mutiny occurred. Uh, Fletcher Christian and uh, several guys uh, mutinied the ship and uh, set the captain, Captain Bly, who was uh, um, quite um, an interesting person. They set, put him and uh, some of his uh, followers in a small boat. And another great story is that this little boat uh, made it to uh, 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 civilization after uh, many months and they finally made their way back to England after almost two years of being set adrift in a small boat. Very fascinating story. Anyway, the mutineers um, uh, took some uh, Tahitian men and women uh, in the boat and they ended up uh, on the Pitcairn Island. Uh, they knew roughly where it was. It uh, was uh, on the maps, but it was charted several hundred miles uh, off course. Anyway, the mystery was solved about 18 years later when, uh, by chance, an American sailor ship discovered Pitcairn. And there was only one mutineer uh, that remained of the original mutineers, and the population was 46. And it was uh, felt to be a very religious little community. And finally, two years later, uh, <clears throat> the news finally reached England what happened to the bounty. <clears throat> so let's go to Pitcairn. Pitcairn is about halfway between uh, the Panama Canal and Auckland, New Zealand. And uh, the Braveheart was doing some work in the area. And so we uh, commissioned the Braveheart to uh, take us uh, to uh, Pitcairn. Pitcairn has a population of uh, less than 40 uh, currently. It's an older population uh, uh, than it used to be. Um, it used to be that uh, a school would educate all the kids up through high school, but now uh, once uh, uh, a child reaches the age of uh, 12 or 13, uh, they go to a boarding school in New Zealand. So only uh, small children are left on the Pitcairn and very few uh, after they see the real world or the populated world uh, dare come back. Some of the older people that have been uh, abroad are coming back to retire on Pitcairn Again, the population is getting older. So who needs Pitcairn? Uh, Pitcairn was number 67 on the most wanted list at the time. So it really wasn't well needed, but uh, it did need some uh, uh, work on the low bands. 
there hadn't been too many 160 meter uh, contacts over the last 30 years. You can see here, um, there were some blip of uh, contacts with various de expeditions in years past, but no expedition had more than 2% of their contacts on 160 meters. And there had only been 3,100 contacts from de expeditions uh, in that length of time. And the local operators, of course, had no uh, uh, contacts on 160. And there was sporadic activity on the higher bands by the, the locals. And uh, uh, Tom Christian, VP6TC, was very active until he became a silent key um, about uh, eight years ago or so. Well, VP6R, um, the goal was to take advantage of low bands and have fun for everybody, not just the operators, but uh, the operating audience as well. We had great support from DX engineering and flex radio systems, ACON amplifiers and low band systems to receive antennas. Um, our location was at one of the highest places on Pitcairn Island, a thousand feet uh, above sea level. And uh, uh, as a result, uh, our propagation was really good, and uh, we had some really great propagation uh, from the antipode to the antipode uh, uh, to Europe. And we tested out a new 160 meter antenna, which we'll show you. We took three rookies who had never been on a de expedition before. And this is uh, some of our equipment that was uh, unloaded from the Bouvet container. We sorted through it, and since we'll be living in a house and having uh, um, uh, food in the house, uh, a lot of our things, uh, our uh, essentials, uh, infrastructure didn't need to go. So we basically just took radio equipment and antennas. But to get to Pitcairn, you fly to Tahiti, and then you take a once a week puddle hopper um, to uh, Manangariva, which is the very southeastern uh, corner of uh, French Polynesia. And then from there, you take a ship to uh, Pitcairn. So from uh, Manangariva to Pitcairn, it's a uh, 32, 34 hour uh, voyage by ship. Matt Jolly um, was our captain, that's his son. And of course, I typically, uh, when I travel on a ship, I learn to uh, speak in porcelain. I don't do well even in uh, relatively calm seas. We arrived at Pitcairn just before dawn. This is one of our first views of Pitcairn, kind of a cloudy, rainy, drizzly day. And uh, Pitcairn uh, has no, um, harbor as such, um, everything that comes to the island and off the island uh, goes by these two uh, long boats. They go out to meet the, the ship and they offload everything into these boats and take it back to the island because there's no safe harbor for any uh, large ship at all. So this is how we um, went to uh, the island in our long boat. Um, no deer, uh, EY8MM made uh, a great video of Pitcairn, and I'd like to share it with you here.
Well, that's a brief tour of Pitcairn. It's a very beautiful place. It's an extinct uh, volcano. We stayed at Andy's house, which is right there. And that was our main operating site and where we lived and slept and ate. And then the old radio site at the very uh, uh, peak of the island um, is where we had our uh, second set of uh, radios and antennas. And that's where we did most of our low band operation from. We'll show you those here in just a minute. Well, about a month before we arrived, um, uh, all of our equipment that we had shipped, uh, the Braveheart had uh, uh, stopped uh, at Pitcairn and offloaded it onto the longboats, as you can see here. And when we arrived, everything was all uh, neatly stacked and organized uh, in the wooden crates or the amplifiers. Uh, a lot of the antenna uh, paraphernalia are in those uh, garbage cans and the uh, containers you see in the background. And inside the main uh, living room area, uh, our personal uh, gear uh, was sitting there. And in the Pelican cases are the uh, flex radios and uh, our, all of our station equipment. Uh, again, some of the antennas were outside. Uh, the first day, uh, we put uh, Yagis together uh, and verticals together. And we had four stations set up and uh, we're a QRV on uh, within six hours. And that first night, we had stations on 20, 30, and 40 meters all night long. And Pitcairn, that's uh, some really, really, really uh, uh, a little bit of rain to uh, some of our equipment trying to uh, get up the hill. You can see it's uh, really slick even after just a short uh, little rainfall. Uh, we put our antennas together uh, and uh, we, DX Engineering supplied uh, some uh, falling derrick masks that we used um, that worked out uh, very, very well. These were designed for um, the, the harsh conditions of Bouvet. And of course they worked really well uh, in a less harsh environment like Pitcairn. And uh, we'll see how these go up here in uh, a little bit. But basically, it's a falling derrick. Uh, uh, you just pull down one side, and the antenna goes up. Uh, you can see. Uh, and we had uh, generators at uh, both sites. Uh, the power is on locally from about uh, 6 or 7 AM until uh, uh, 10 o'clock at night. Uh, whenever the power master uh, gets up and goes to bed, he turns uh, the island electricity on and, and then off. So in the evenings, uh, uh, we used our generators when we didn't have local power. At the radio site, we used uh, generators all the time. This is Andy's location. You can see all the antennas um, that are up uh, at this uh, very high point. Again, this is 1,000 feet above uh, sea level. The old radio site had some old uh, towers. We'll see those here shortly. Uh, but this is where we put up our uh, uh, low band antennas. Inside the old radio uh, shack, which isn't used anymore, um, it was very dirty, uh, some old uh, antiquated equipment. Um, as you can see, very filthy. Uh, some rain had leaked in, and uh, it really wasn't in the best shape. And uh, some old radio equipment. Uh, it would have been fun to try and get this on the air, but uh, of course, it was all rusted and uh, totally dilapidated. There was an old uh, Yagi uh, up there, and if you look carefully at the element that's closest to us on the right, you can see moss growing out of the elements. And this antenna uh, didn't really work at all. Here's a close-up picture of some of those towers. Um, this is why we didn't climb them, because there wasn't anything climbable left. The amazing thing is that these towers were still, uh, still vertical. It hadn't fallen down in storms. This is our uh, new 160-meter uh, antenna that uh, DX Engineering uh, custom built uh, for Bouvet. It's 90 feet tall and has a 40-foot uh, falling derrick, and it really worked well. This is it uh, um, uh, as a package, and uh, it was very easy to put together. The tower is made from aluminum. It's very easy uh, to carry and to maneuver around. Uh, this is looking from the top of it down toward the base, and you can see the falling derrick, and uh, you'll see a video of us uh, putting it up. Uh, this is from the base looking toward the top, and you can see the radials haven't been laid out yet. Here's a video of how it goes up. Between the two pine trees there, you can see our 80 meter uh, vertical uh, in the wind. Okay. Go! Stop! 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 Stop!
So there we are. That's how a falling derrick works to get uh, these big antennas up. And then we laid out uh, lots and lots of radials uh, for 160. And we had a good matching network. Uh, it worked very well. Of course, nighttime was when it really sang. We had uh, two beverages, a 2,000 foot beverage to uh, North America and Europe is just on the other side of North America. And then we had a 600 foot beverage uh, to uh, Japan and Asia. And we used the low band systems uh, uh, beverage controller. Here's our 80 meter vertical and uh, lots of radials under that too. And uh, inside the old radio shack, uh, we had uh, uh, three stations. This is two of them. Um, on the left is the 80 meter uh, station. On the right is the 160. Uh, during the daytime, we use these on other bands as well. You can see the uh, Maestro and our laptop on top of the 6700s. And we had the Acom 1500 amplifiers. We had a lot of uh, uh, gray line and common darkness all over the world, except for Antarctica and some of the Indian Ocean. The first night in 160, Nodir was very happy. He made over 700 contacts the first night. Um, in the house uh, uh, where we lived, uh, we had four stations set up, four flex stations. Uh, we had three four-man teams. We alternated in three and four-hour shifts. So, so in a, uh, it, it was turned out to be a 21-hour day. So you could, uh, as the days went by, you could rotate uh, through the propagation. This is our view as we were uh, sitting in our operating sites, again, a thousand feet above sea level. The flex radios work very well. As you know, FTA can be very relaxing. It can make, uh, make you kind of sick. Kilo Charlie 9, Victor Fox, Italy 5932. Thank you, Victor Papa 6 Radio. Delta Lima, Delta Lima again, please. Kilo Delta 2 Radio Delta. You can see there must have been a dead band there. Anyway, uh, we were there in October, November, and you can see uh, that's when the rainfall was uh, about the least and nice temperatures, you know, in the 70s during the daytime. Uh, it was uh, very pleasant. However, uh, for several days, a cyclone, as they call hurricanes in the southern hemisphere, just hung over us and rained and rained and rained. And the mud, you just wouldn't believe. It was just, uh, and it gets into everything. And it's really slick and treacherous uh, going up to the radio site. Um, you can see I'd fallen a couple times, but it's a uh, really slick, greasy mud. And during the hurricane or cyclone, uh, a lot of the leaves got shredded off of the palm trees. It even bent uh, the top of our 160 meter vertical. We did operate the CQ Worldwide uh, sideband contest. You can see uh, the bands are very active. Um, the only active band, inactive band was 40 meters. We only made 41 contacts on uh, 160, which kind of shows uh, how worthless sideband can be sometimes uh, when you're a long ways away and uh, weak signals. We made uh, almost 14,000 points uh, 14 million points in, in the contest. And then somebody said, uh, how far apart were your uh, two radio sites? Were you within the, the, the 500 meter rule for antenna separation? Well, there's Andy's place. Here's the old radio site. When you go to Google Earth, we're just under 500 meters. So we were uh, okay and in the clear. So that worked out well. Again, this is our 160 meter station, typical flex uh, layout, uh, Maestro uh, uh, 6700, uh, the computer and keyboard and the amplifier and the receive antenna control on top of that. This is how it looked at night. Uh, and this is how our signal sounded uh, in Ohio from K8CX. And then in England.
And at uh, LY7M. And uh, our nights, uh, we had a great first night, set over 700 contacts. The next night uh, wasn't so good, then 500, almost 400, 300 something. There were some good nights and bad nights, as you can see. And then during the 48 hours of the contest, we only made 43 contacts. And we spent two nights on FT8 and had a total of uh, uh, almost 750 uh, FT8 contacts on 160. Um, our observations, 23% uh, uh, of our uh, low band contacts uh, were with uh, Europe, which was uh, quite amazing. Before there'd only been five contacts uh, with zone 16 from Pitcairn, and now there were 156. And we found out that long path doesn't repeat every night. There are peaks of clouds that are random. So you just have to be there when that cloud of uh, propagation is over you. And they're constantly changing and they can be very short. So you just have to be there. And propagation can exist outside the gray line, even on both sides. For example, this is one hour after sunrise in England. Uh, That's amazing, isn't it? An important thing in working the low bands is to match the speed of the operator because you don't know what the flutter and uh, auroral uh, uh, propagation is like at the other end all the time. So uh, match the speed of the operator. And sometimes even when the band can be busy, it uh, goes dead. Uh, you can see there was a lot of QR Nancy here from uh, some thunderstorms and there's no signals on the band. So even the best of operators uh, succumb to uh, uh, sleep and fatigue at times. So. It happens to all of us. And we found that uh, one person can operate two radios, two FT8 uh, radios at once uh, during this expedition, and sometimes even uh, three. And at one time we had four, uh, four radios controlled by one person operating FT8 in the fox and hound mode. And FT8, uh, we were on for two nights, made uh, over 700 contacts, and uh, over half was Europe. Um, and the other half was North America and Asia. Uh, compared to uh, CW, where uh, we only 23% uh, of the contacts were with Europe. And uh, of the FT8 contacts, 40% uh, uh, were unique to FT8 only. In other words, they didn't work us on a sideband or CW on 160. 60 meters, we were on a couple nights. Uh, we made 900 cues um, and over half were Europe. Again, that's shooting right through North America. Uh, North America is about halfway between uh, uh, Europe and uh, Pitcairn. This was our uh, quarter wave vertical with the many radials that we use on 60 meters. And uh, Fox and Hound mode, you could work uh, four or five stations at once. And you can see the rates uh, are, um, uh, you know, just under uh, long term uh, 400 contacts an hour. And you, you know, which is basically four times what you could do with RTTY uh, on a de-expedition. And then if one operator can operate uh, two or three radios or more, just think of uh, how many cues an hour you can make with just the FT8 mode. We did some EME work. This is our uh, uh, two meter uh, EME and six meter EME antenna. And uh, this is how excited the guys were after the first contact. We made 36 contacts. Um, uh, two of the guys were dedicated to that. And the island power is on, like I said, from about 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. Uh, because of uh, the expensive electricity, uh, there's a lot of um, switching power supplies, a lot of LEDs, a very high noise for you know, over the entire island. And uh, when the power goes off, the noise floor just drops by many, many dB. And so the only time we could operate was uh, after the lights go out and uh, when the moon was up. And it was a little bit later each day. And uh, we had about 17 hours of actual operating time and made uh, uh, two cues an hour, basically. And uh, toward the end, that severe storm uh, broke some of the parts of the beam. These are just some beautiful pictures of uh, Pitcairn. Um, it's a very, very beautiful place. Uh, uh, I can't wait to go back someday.
you can go through these uh, tropical jungle-like areas uh, where it's humid and uh, uh, very uh, uh, hot. And then you step out and you literally in desert where nothing's growing in just uh, a few minutes. It's uh, quite an amazing uh, island. There's one tortoise on the island. This is the anchor of the bounty and its cannon, one of its cannons. And uh, like I said, it's a very beautiful place. Uh, um, this is uh, Adamstown uh, at night um, when the city lights are out. And you can see uh, uh, Andy's place, that uh, white hot uh, light uh, just to the right. And then you can see the old radio site with some lights on uh, at the very right side of the picture there. And then all too soon, it was uh, time to pack up and go home. We did leave some antennas uh, for some of the locals. Here's Meralda, VP6MW. She's on uh, almost every day now. Um, and uh, uh, she's really uh, quite an interesting gal. And they uh, gave us a farewell dinner at the community center. Uh, it was a potluck, uh, unexpected, and uh, it was uh, a lot of fun. Absolutely tremendous people that live there. We saw Tom Christian's uh, grave um, in the cemetery. Uh, I remember even as a kid listening to him uh, uh, just uh, work DX and rag chew with, uh, with guys uh, by the hours. I uh, did my homework in high school. Here's our uh, breakdown. We made 82,000 contacts. Um, this is probably the first expedition where there were more digital cues than uh, sideband cues. And of course, CW is always uh, right up there toward the top. So 30% of our cues uh, were with FT8. And 30% uh, of our uh, low band uh, uh, contacts to uh, Europe were, uh, uh, were made. 30%, uh, that's, that's really a good number. Of course, we have the obligatory flags and uh, DX Engineering supplied a lot of the antennas and the flex radio. Uh, uh, we really can't thank them enough for supplying uh, the 6700s and maestros that we used. And all too soon, it's uh, we have to leave Pitcairn and head home. And uh, we met our goals. Um, we had fun, especially on the low bands. Uh, we had, a, again, a lot of good support from DX Engineering and flex radio, ACOM, many clubs and individuals. And our location, uh, 1,000 feet above uh, sea level, was absolutely perfect. And we had uh, excellent propagation. And uh, we uh, tested out a new uh, de-expedition 160-meter uh, antenna. There's been a lot of movies uh, made about Pitcairn. Um, the Pitcairners uh, say that the one on the right by Mel Gibson is probably the most accurate. And here's our movie.
Take the Papa Six Radio. November 9, Delta Radio. Kilo Echo 5, Bravo Romeo, 5 and 9. Thank you. November 3, Tango, India, Romeo. November 3, Tango, India, Radio, 5 and 9. You can see it's a long ways to Iowa, but uh, when you're uh, having fun on an expedition, you're having more fun than anyone should ever be allowed to have. It's uh, an absolute blast, particularly when you can use uh, good equipment like uh, uh, the flex radios. Uh, several of us uh, met our wives in Tahiti and spent an extra week or 10 days there. And uh, my wife and I, Vivian, uh, KL7YL and I celebrated our 45th wedding anniversary uh, there. And uh, this is our view from our little bungalow that we uh, rented. And uh, as the sun sets, you can almost see the bounty uh, heading uh, out to uh, Pitcairn Island. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> 